Hey guys, this is Mr. O'Brien again, and this is your last video for the Keystone Biology Review. This is Topic 8, and this covers ecology. So, when we talk about ecology, we're talking about living and non-living things in an ecosystem. Now, an ecosystem is composed of biotic and abiotic factors, and biotic are the living things in an ecosystem. Abiotic factors are the non-living things. Okay, I often like to think biotic, biology is the study of life, biotic, living factors. Abiotic, antibiotic, non-living things. So we look here, we're going to look at biotic factors in red. This is things like the frog, the fish, okay, the flowers, okay, the bugs, living things that compose an ecosystem. Now, our abiotic or non-living things are the rocks, the water in general, the soil, okay? These are non-living factors that still make up the ecosystem. Now, abiotic is the climate, it's the weather, okay, um, rain, stuff like that, okay? Whereas biotic are living things, animals, microorganisms, all that sort of stuff in an ecosystem, now, let's talk about the levels of ecological organization. Now, the first level is an organism. So, like our bison right here, okay? An organism is an independent individual that possesses all the characteristics of life that we talked about in uh, the first video. Second level of ecological organi organization is a population. So, instead of one bison, we for organism, we now have a herd of bison, many of the same group of organisms in the same area, of the same species. Now, community could also be referred to as biological community is all living things in an area. So the hawks, the snakes, the bison, the prairie dog, and even the grass. So community is just composed of the living things in an area. Then we have ecosystem. And an ecosystem are the living and non-living things, so the abiotic and biotic factors. So we have hawk, snake, bison, prairie dog, grasses, stream, rocks, air. Then we go to biome, and a biome is a region on Earth characterized by a specific climate and dominated by um, plants and animals suited to live in that climate or geographic area. So this biome right here is most likely grasslands. Now again, certain areas are dominated by certain animals and certain plants. And the last one, biosphere, and this is just a region on Earth where that contains all living things. <coughs> okay, so these are our levels of ecological organization. Organism, okay, composed of one individual. Population, composed of the many organisms. Community, all living things in an ecosystem. An ecosystem is the biotic and abiotic factors. Biome, specific region characterized by its characteristics and our biosphere, where all life exists. Now, biomes, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in. There's six major biomes that we do talk about, the rainforest, and the rainforest obviously characterized warm temperatures in the tropics, a lot of um, rain, very warm, and there's a great deal of biodiversity in this location. Actually, the most biodiversity that we will see. Okay, working our way down tundra, and tundra is characterized by pine trees, okay, or spruce trees, often called the spruce moose belt, okay, and this goes all the way from Alaska all the way through Russia, and pine trees is the dominating feature, okay, not many broadleaf trees, okay, which is distinguishing characteristic of our temperate deciduous, four distinct seasons, Okay, is our characteristic. Okay, so we have winter, spring, fall, um, and summer. Okay, tundra up here, tundra is very cold, very snowy, and is dominated by something called permafrost or permanently frozen ground in that area. Desert, okay, has no rain. Okay, less than 25 inches, 9.9 .9 centimeters. And then finally, grasslands, which are simply just grass. They do not have much water, no trees, just grassy shrubs. Now, this is also the breadbasket of our country. The reason, 
because this is where the majority of our crops are grown. Now, energy from the sun flows through all ecosystems. So when we look at food chains and food webs, we look at the arrows. The arrows point in the direction the energy is flowing. So arrows in a food chain always point in the direction of the energy transfer, or I like to say, the organism that is getting the full belly. So sunlight, Mr. Sunshine right here, is the ultimate source of all energy on Earth. So without the sun, all of our food chains can't start, okay? Because producers need are the ones that need to put the energy in all of these ecosystems. Now, some of the organisms that we can see in food chain, the first one is a producer. Now, the producer... The pro the producer, they make their own energy, and this is the form of plants, and they do this through a process of photosynthesis, okay? So, Mr. Tree right here, the tree takes in carbon dioxide and water and converts that into energy. Now, we also have consumers, and consumers get their energy from eating or consuming something else. So, we have two different types. Herbivores eat solely plants, like our cows right here. Okay, and we have carnivores which eat meats like our coyote right here. Again, producers make their own energy, photosynthesis. They also use chemosynthesis. Consumers get their energy from eating or consuming something else. Now, our trophic levels are levels of which organisms feed at. And all trophic levels start with producers at the bottom. Now, the reason that there are so many producers is because... Uh, this is that this is uh there's readily a lot of energy available from the sunlight. So what happens is as we go up trophic levels, we decrease the number of organisms. Okay? So it goes producers down at the bottom and primary consumers eat producers. Secondary consumers eat primary consumers. Tertiary consumers eat secondary consumers, and quaternary are the top of the food chain, okay? So these are our trophic levels we will be talking about. Now, why we often see a decreasing pattern of organisms as we go up in trophic level is this law of 10%. So what this law states is that only 10% of energy is transferred from one trophic level to the next. So for example, if there is... A thousand units of energy available at the bottom in the producers. When the primary consumers eat that, only a hundred is left. When secondary consumers eat the primary consumers, only ten is left. And when tertiary eat the secondary, only one is left. So this is the reason that food chains only usually have three or four links because of this law of 10%. We often run out of energy as we move up the food chain. Now, food chains only show one path of that animal finding food. So the grass being eaten by the grasshopper and the frog eats the grasshopper and the snake eats the frog and the um, hawk eats the snake and then the fungus decomposes them. So you see there's only one thing that goes on. Now, in a food web, we show all the interactions. So the hawk eats the grasshopper, the spider, the mouse, the weasel. Okay, so it shows everything that is occurring in an ecosystem. Now, living things interact with each other, and how they interact, we call it different things. So mutualism is when both organisms benefit, okay? So mutualism, one benefits, the other one benefits. Both are happy in this scenario. Commensalism is when one organism benefits and the other is unaffected, or plus and no effect in the other one, okay? Parasitism, one benefits, the other one is negatively affected, plus, minus. And predator-prey, one species catches and eats another, that would be plus, minus. And finally, competition, where two species are competing for the same resources. Both of them are negatively affected. So let's go through each one of these. Mutualism is when both organisms benefit, so, for example, bees and flowers. Bees need to get uh, nectar from the flower, and the flower needs the bee in order to fertilize all of the other flowers around it. Both are gaining. 
Commensalism, one benefits, other one is unaffected. The barnacles live on a blue whale. The blue whale, unaffected by the barnacles, barnacles get a free place to live. Parasitism, a tapeworm in the human body. Tapeworm benefits, human does not benefit. Predator prey, lion eating a zebra. Obviously, the lion is going to benefit, zebra not so much. In competition, two deer fighting over a mate. Both are negatively affected. Now let's talk about the different types of cycles that we have in an environment here, okay? So the first one we're going to talk about is the carbon cycle. Now, carbon cycle is composed of four parts, decomposition, animals dying and decomposing, and the carbon is being replaced back in the environment, okay? So cellular respiration, what happens is, is this is arrow two, obviously, when cellular respiration occurs, CO2 is produced and enters into the atmosphere. Number three, photosynthesis. We use that CO2 and convert it into oxygen, which is why we see it coming out of the end. And then combustion is just the burning of fossil fuels. And again, CO2. Now, combustion is the one that is man-made. And what this does is combustion leads to um, a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. So CO2 is what we refer to as a natural thermostat. In other words, the more CO2 we have in our atmosphere, the higher the temperatures are going to be. So humans burning more fossil fuels increases that CO2, which is going to increase temps. Okay, So this is where we hear that global climate change coming from mostly from the combustion of fossil fuels in our environment. Now, the nitrogen cycle is the process of how animals, or I'm sorry, how plants actually convert nitrogen into um, usable nitrogen. So plants and animals need nitrogen in order to form macromolecules. So even though the atmosphere is 80% nitrogen, plants get their nitrogen from the soil. And the way that they do this is, there's these things called nitrogen fixators Oop. and nitrogen fixators. And what these do is they convert um, nitrogen in the atmosphere and they convert it into a usable form of nitrogen for a plant. So these are things like bacteria and there are some plants that are nitrogen fixators as well. So what happens is this nitrogen from the atmosphere, it enters into the ground and these bacteria, they convert that into a usable form such as ammonia, uh, which is then converted into nitrates, which is our plants are able to use. So even though you know the, the atmosphere is full of nitrogen, we can't use it directly. We have to use these nitrogen fixators to get this into the atmosphere, or into the soil, excuse me. Now the water cycle, okay, the water cycle, we're gonna start with number one right here, and this is evaporation, or water heating up and turning into a gas, okay? Another way that water can enter into the atmosphere is transpiration. Transpiration, okay, it sends water, or the plants suck up water through the roots, and then it leaves through the leaves into the atmosphere. So when that water gets in the atmosphere, eventually it condenses and forms clouds. So condensation is the formation of clouds in our atmosphere. Okay. Now number four, the arrow coming down, obviously that's precipitation. And water can do two things. It can either run off back into a pond or a lake or a stream, or it can get absorbed into groundwater which is called infiltration. So the water cycle, obviously there's different parts. This is oversimplified. Evaporation, transpiration gets um, H2O into the atmosphere. Okay, Condensation, precipitation, this is how it comes back to the Earth's surface. And runoff is just says where it goes once it comes back to Earth. Now, succession or ecological section is a succession is a change in an ecosystem over time. So for example, we have two different types. We have primary succession, which starts from bare rock. And we have secondary succession where soil is remained. This is like when a forest fire happens. Okay. So 
um, what happens in ecological succession is this is pretty much how the environment changes. So we start with, you know, small shrubs, grasses, goes to some flowers. Then we get these um, pine trees and then to eventually we reach our climax community. So primary succession is a much longer process because we have to start from bare rock. Whereas secondary is much shorter because we already have that soil established. Now, the environment and populations of the environment are affected by factors. And these factors are limiting factors. So it determines the carrying capacity of an ecosystem for a particular species. So this is like water, um, space, food, predators, disease. In other words, these factors right here, they determine how many organisms can actually live there. So I like to think of it like a weight that's holding, you know, a balloon down, right? So there's only a certain height that that balloon can ever get to. And that is the carrying capacity, which is the largest population that an environment can support at any given time. So this is your topic gate review, your crash course in ecology to help you for the Keystone Biology exam. So hopefully that this video helps you and hopefully you guys are successful when you take the Keystones at the end of the year. This is Mr. O'Brien signing off.